Hello and welcome to Secure World Behind the Scenes, our exclusive interview series. This is Tom Bechtold, your host for today's program. Thank you for joining us. Today, the Secure World Media team will be talking with Amy Baker and Kurt Wesco from Wombat Security and taking an in-depth look at the annual State of the Fish report. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our special guests. Amy Baker is the Vice President of Marketing at Wombat Security, has been in the information technology and security industry for almost 20 years, and has been specifically focused on information security awareness and training for the last several years. Amy led the development of Wombat's best practices methodology for security education programs, and along with her team, drives the enhancement of their security education software. She has presented at Gartner Security and Risk Management Summits, ISSA, ISACA, eCrime Congress, Secure World, and Security Con Current. Kurt Wesco is Chief Architect at Wombat Security. Kurt is responsible for ensuring Wombat's software and systems are built on a sound foundation. He brings over 10 years of experience in engineering across multiple industries, he also serves as a faculty member in the School of Computer Sciences Master's Program in eBusiness at Carnegie Mellon University. Kurt earned his Master's of Science in e-commerce from CMU and a Bachelor's in Science in Computer Engineering from the University of Pittsburgh. Bruce, I'm going to turn things over to you to get things kicked off. Thank you, Tom, and Amy and Kurt, a pleasure to speak with you and uh, find out a little bit more about the State of the Fish 2018. And I just finished reviewing the report myself, and, and it's an impressive. I mean, it's 18 pages long. It is so robust. The first question that I have is, how much data collection is this based off of, and how do you collect so much data to create a report that, that is so detailed? So that's a great question. This is Amy, and I'd love, I'm happy to answer that for you. So we looked at a lot of different sources of data that we thought would be really interesting to our information security professionals and the, the audience of people who we think get the most from this report. So we started looking at this report from our customer, aggregate customer data, and what were their experiences in their simulated phishing attacks and how their audiences and employees were responding to those. That's, of course, the sig most significant set of data that we look at. And then over time, we decided that it would be really interesting to also survey um, our audience of people. We survey a database of more than 100,000 information security professionals to get those 10,000 plus responses that we refer to inside the report itself. We think that that particular content is really important as well. That's not just customer content, but anybody whom we might have reached out to or might have reached out to us about security awareness and training. And then last but not least, we really think it's interesting and important for everyone to stay rooted and grounded in what awareness is around the world on an end user perspective, computer users. So we added this survey in the last year or so, two years I guess, that really does go out to people who are computer-based users. It's almost a man on the street survey, um, computer-based users to understand their um, knowledge of basic concepts in cybersecurity. So we think those three things come together very well to give a full view of the state of phishing attacks um, from the people who are trying to defend against them the most. Okay, that is fantastic, and I mean, it's, it's no wonder you can create such a detailed report with all of that information. Now, one of the things I was wondering about is this just doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, the, the level of detail that you're going to um, in incorporating new areas of research into it. W what's the backstory of the State of the Fish and, and how did it get started? Great question. So the State of the Fish report was actually created by um, colleagues of ours who came to us through an acquisition. Um, that acquisition, you might remember, and actually it's the product name that we use for simulated attacks today is called ThreatSim. So we acquired ThreatSim in 2015, and this was a report that they had generated um, before we acquired them. And then we continued the report and then continued to add data sources to it. Of course, when they started their number of customers and their aggregate data they were looking at was a much sm smaller data set than we were able to provide when we acquired them and then really added a much, much larger database 
of customer data, and then of course started going out to all those other sources we just referenced. So we continue to improve upon it. We've added more and more surveys. We went from annual surveys of information security professionals to quarterly to make sure that we're getting as much robust data as we can. So that's a little bit of the history behind it. Okay, that is fantastic. And uh, let's move now into the actual report itself this year, 2018. Uh, what are two or three or four, or however you want to list, that just but a few of the big key changes that we saw in the state of the fish as we look ahead to 2018? So key changes. Yeah, see, so. I would say that we did see the um, average failure rate of simulated attacks decline year over year kind of significantly, more than we would have expected from a decline perspective. So that 9% is below a double-digit number, yeah. and I think we found that surprising. Would you agree with that, Chris? Yeah, so that was surprising. Um, I think we also got, I mean, in, in the Beyond the Fish report, we were seeing this with some of the survey results too, but in State of the Fish, we got further confirmation of kind of the, dif the, the gap and differences between the EU audience and the U.S. audience. Great um, and the first, it, we, you know, we, we knew there were differences in behaviors from, from, that, from the earlier report, um, but we really saw that there's, there's, dif there's definitely knowledge gaps there that exist both from a maturity standpoint, but also just uh, variety and it pushes towards that you really have to understand your audience. You can't just make a one-size-fits-all program. So uh, that was definitely one that we continue to see confirmation of um, as we're getting deeper into analysis and, and not just looking at everybody as a whole. Um, one other piece that I wanted to comment on is one of the survey questions we ask information security professionals is how, what phishing impacts they've experienced and how they measure the cost of phishing. In previous year's data, we actually showed a lot more people focusing on the loss of productivity for employees and the phishing in, as a phishing impact, and that really wasn't as prevalent this year. Um, they measured the cost of phishing that way, but didn't no, they didn't note that as a particular impact. They were much more focused on something more tangible like malware infections, compromised accounts, things like that. Um, we still believe that that loss of employee productivity is really key. People are using it to measure, but uh, it didn't come up in that um, area where people said they experienced particular impact. Yeah, and similar to that, we're seeing too that, I mean, we basically hit the point where now everybody's doing something. And that's been a trend the report's shown over the last couple of years, but everybody is measuring risk and measuring risk with respect to phishing now at this point. Um, so an organization is doing nothing is really behind the uh, eight ball at this point. Um, and we're seeing the trend going towards, okay, now I'm doing things and measuring it. And do I have remediation programs? Am I assessing people? Or what am I doing with people who are showing repeated failures? And how am I reaching out to them and trying to, get, and trying to put them together that actually can help catch them and bring them forward as well? Okay, that's great. Um, and that actually uh, you know, leads us to our next question. Um, what are you seeing that works? What is a mature uh, phishing prevention or security awareness uh, program look like here in 2018 as you know, your audience might get tired of hearing about it, that is your employees, and those doing phishing are getting more sophisticated? What does a mature program look like? That's a great question. This is one of those areas of the report that we added this year that we think is so important because as people do mature in their programs and they're spent, they've spent maybe a couple of years working on them, we have, um, we've indicated some really great results, 30% improvement in click rates on simulated attacks and or we're hoping that translates to actual attacks as well, of course. But what we also sometimes see is a little bit of a slowdown in activity, and that's the part that causes us, us concern. We want to make sure people continue to keep the pressure on end users to continue their training and to have a continuing approach of both assessments and education, not just simulated attacks, not just um, education itself, but the two of those together that lead to the best behavior change. Um, what I think could happen is when you have a brand new program and it's new, you have a lot of enthusiasm around it and people have a lot of enthusiasm in the business. And then maybe over time people think, oh, well, everyone knows what they need to know and we're going to maybe not um, have as much frequency or perhaps not put as much focus on this. And of course the cyber criminals are not, are not letting up on their frequency of attacks or their focus on organizations at all. So we really recommend people not set it and forget it, but stay focused on um, 
the key threats that are out there, making sure they're continuing to evolve their program, even adding layers of creativity to their program to keep their end users engaged, perhaps implementing things like gamification or other things that could be contests in their organization to help people, pe keep people engaged, because we really don't want to see a fall off once they've had some initial really positive results. Okay, that's great, that's great. Um, another question that I have, and this springboards off something you said earlier, was that you found differences in the way the audiences behave. Um, that is, you know, the audience you're trying to reach within your company as you create the security awareness program. Um, what, what should you be looking at? How do you know what is the right approach for the group of employees that I have? a good question. I mean, culture, um, and I'm sure yeah. Kurt has something to add to this too, culture really has a huge part to play in your security education program. We are asking security professionals to put a marketing hat on and, and know their audience and know what types of things their audience will respond to, to know how much training is too much, mm -hmm. to know what types of phishing attacks they're receiving, um, things like that. And so there is no one size fits all in our opinion. Do you have one to add to that? Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, there, so, uh, it's, it's kind of like, you know, delivery, say delivery of medicine or something like that. You know, if you take the wrong approach to people, then, then everything's going to fall on its face and people aren't going to be receptive to it. The reality is, as a security professional, you have the hard side of this because you're trying, you have to figure out how to convince people, convince your end users to take training, to, you know, not to have that immediate um, response when they fall for the fish of, you tricked me, this is horrible, and, and turn off from it. Because ultimately, those times are when you have the best chance of affecting change on the user. Um, and so really making this something that they see as constructive, as positive for them, um, as, and as, as how they're going to actually help the organization, and understanding how to reach them and motivate them in that way, um, like as Amy was saying about either through contests, um, and even when you look at things like that, you know, not all con contests aren't a one-size-fits-all thing. You don't have to look at it saying, I'm making a game, or I'm making a leaderboard, or I'm making this. You know, sometimes you can do things at a department level, or a business unit level, or a geography level. Um, you don't have to call individuals out or do things at an individual level that, that, that have impact. Sometimes that's beneficial because people are hyper competitive. Sometimes, you know, you may have a, a more timid culture or people who are more sensitive to that and you're better off working it at an aggregate level and not individualizing it. Um, so um, I think that th all the techniques that are out there in the, in the breadth of things we have make it, make it great because you have a lot of things you're disposable to use. You just have to figure out how to match that tool set to what your, what your employees like and what's been successful in other areas, uh, whether it's, you know, for a, you know, market internal communications campaigns or whatever. Those types of lessons for how you communicate with your end users are really applicable here. The other thing that Kurt touched on that I really wanted to expand upon, Bruce, is as you said, you've read the report. One of the things that's new to this year's report is the discussion of a consequences model. This is really cultural as well. So what is the, is there a negative um, for people when they do make a mistake or when they take an action that could be detrimental to the organization? We're finding, as we've surveyed our information security professionals, that there are more and more um, our penalties or consequences to their programs because in some cases there's just so much financial cost associated with them. So we saw that some, in some cases, you know, leading to termination or monetary penalties or things like that. Um, and I think it's a hard balance between those types of penalties and Kurt's point on the, we want people to not feel like this is such a negative thing that they want to feel like this is positive that they're trying to teach them. But um, as organizations, Organizations feel obligated to add some sort of consequences to a bad behavior, I think it's harder and harder to balance the positive. Would you agree? Yeah, and I think it, a lot of it comes down to what exactly they're trying to get out of it. So, you know, if, if you're someone handling um, health records, there's a serious consequence of the business if you if this were a live fish and you breached data and, 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 and uh, created a, a HIPAA situation for them. And so, um, you know, in that case, if a company is truly doing a simulation and sending a fish with the intent of identifying would, would you do something that would lead to a breach, 
you have to look at the business impact of that in, in terms of how in terms of what you're going to do for the people who fall or continue maybe show repeated failures for it. So a lot of it comes down to what you're actually trying to get out of the simulation. Are you just trying to see general fish and how are people falling for them? Are you doing targeted scenarios that you think really reflect bi truly business impacting incidents um, and the consequences kind of have to go along with that? Yeah, that's very good. And, and actually, I know Tom and I have been on uh, some webcasts where there's been much debate over what you do around, um, around that very issue of discipline or not. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, thanks for mentioning that you, you added that this year, um, that part of the survey. Uh, now, I also want to take a look at the GDPR zone. So the folks in the EU who will be seeing GDPR kick in this year, and I know that's one of the things that, that you looked at to see, is behavior different? Is security awareness uh, different in the EU versus other parts of the world? What, what did you find? That's, that's been really interesting for us because I think we assumed that the knowledge levels will be the same. Um, in all of these regions, and what we're finding is some really vast differences. Um, so um, both from security professionals and from the end users themselves. So the security professionals' approach to their program is different between those two regions in the U.S. and the U.K. So for example, in the U.S., 86% of organizations assess susceptibility to phishing attacks, but only 53% in the U.K. So a really, a really big difference in their program overall and, and some of the tools that they might be using. Um, they even saw some differences in the, what they were experiencing. Um, in the U.S., 57% of organizations experience spear phishing, but in the U.K., only 36% claim to experience spear phishing. So I'm sure that those types of um, data points are really driving some of the larger differences. If they're not experiencing spear phishing, then their approach to addressing susceptibility to phishing attacks is going to be different and not as important to them. And therefore, then their training programs will be different and perhaps not as, as sophisticated or perhaps not as thorough because they're not trying to solve the same problems. To Kurt's point about what problem are you trying to solve. So we definitely are seeing some differences there. Um, I know that there was another threat vector that we wanted to talk about as well. Um, that's sort of emerging, and that's with regard to smishing. But I'm going to turn that over to Kurt to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, right. And so, I mean, we're this, we're talking about this today actually in a different context. So that smish, you know, for the EU market and especially for the non-US markets, in general, the prevalence of smishing is 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 much um, higher in those areas than we typically see in the US. Uh, but what was interesting for us was it seems like actually phishing is a fairly message agnostic. Um, the problem, um, because we found that people were equally as likely to fall for a fish as they were to fall for a smish, um, and I think that you know it also presents some sort of grave concerns overall. Because if if this is a generalization, and we're seeing that you know it doesn't matter what messaging medium you use to send a social engineering attack to a user, um, we have I think there's other systems like you consider a Slack or an internal messaging systems where we have more trust in these because they seem like corporate systems that they they can't get attacked. Um, I'm not trying to pick on Slack, but you know their integration is is one of their big things. That's a you know an open landscape too for for attack, and so um, it's it's kind of scary to think to think of systems where people have more trust in them, and we could see even higher failure rates on on things on things like that. Um, but it's definitely concerning with the idea that that it doesn't really matter the medium you send a message in, people are just as likely to fall for it. Um, I think in the EU, the other thing we've seen, you know, longer term around this has been, it, it, you know, it, and this comes out of GDPR as, you know, an example of this and some of the data privacy uh, directives in the past. They're just more likely to run programs at an aggregate level. Um, they tend to not target individuals um, in, when it comes to how they analyze data and report on it. Um, they're much more likely to look at either department level reporting or, or some other aggregation off of that and make decisions that way. It's a great point. So it changes really the approach to the program itself if they're not going down to the individual level. And then, of course, the consequences model for someone having made a mistake is going to be very different, too, if they're not taking it down to the individual consequences, pretty impossible to actually even exact if you don't get to an individual level. So definitely seeing some really big differences there that we're going to continue to keep an eye on year over year as we run the report and, and broaden our global reach of the data that we consume and then analyze and report back. 
Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, what areas do you think security professionals should be training on that they may be ignoring or neglecting uh, right now? So I think what's interesting is it's kind of hard to even enter into this context seeing as we're talking about the state of the fish report. But we put this report out because there is so much fo focus on phishing attacks. But I think in some cases what happens is people are so focused on phishing attacks they're forgetting some of the bad behaviors that could lead to a successful phishing attack. So we really do believe that um, in addition to phishing itself, they should spend time on other threat topics like our Beyond the Fish report comments on. So things like data protection and destruction, um, safer web browsing, safe social media use, um, being safe on their mobile devices and protecting data on their mobile devices are all topical areas that we saw some weaknesses in in the, in the most previous version of the Beyond the Fish report that I'm constantly arguing could really be part of what makes phishing attacks so successful, especially spear phishing because end users are tending without understanding it, oversharing data that a cyber cr criminal can pick up and use to stage targeted attacks. So I do think that there's a little bit of a cause and effect here that might be overlooked because there's so much focus on that one threat vector of phishing. One of the other things that uh, you had mentioned uh, in the report is that there are influential factors um, that, uh, that can make a difference uh, in the way phishing threats or security awareness works or, or doesn't work. Um, and I was interested not only program maturity, which we talked about, um, but, but even that there could be factors like days of the week or time of day that could affect click rates. I mean, is there such a thing as a high-risk time for employees? Uh, do, do you see something like that that businesses should be on the lookout for? So there's definitely trends in when you see people answering emails. Um, I'd say generically, um, you know, typically you're looking between seven and nine. So looking at well, no, it's like a seven to nine thirty in the morning as people are arriving, they're typically going to go through mail and have a bulk of them, and and that's really um, what when the risk is higher. Um, if you're if you're getting one, two, three mails at a time, and, and you can you can afford the time to look at it do some thinking about it and, and make the right decisions about it. But when you've got 20, 30 to get through and you know you've got to move in five minutes, um, or when you're looking at them on your phone, just sort of scrolling through them while doing something else, that lack of contextual awareness and, and just sort of doing it as a side task is a lot of what opens you up um, to, to be more likely to fall for these. Um, in terms of days of the week, um, you know, Friday tends, tends to be a slower day. Um, that's, uh, we've seen that historically over the last couple of years, that they, they tend to be slower. Um, we did see some things where fish, people were tending to send fish more on Sunday night to get them into your box first thing Monday morning, so that's that last mail as you're scrolling through and you just kind of hit it and, and you're, they found, I think they were finding higher success rates with that. But in terms of weekdays, you know, your general Monday through Thursday, it's going to be probably more time of day based. They're trying to catch you at a time when you're likely going to have an abundance of mail to go through. It's interesting, it made me think of a story from a client of ours who they sent their simulated phishing attacks at 6 a.m. in the time frame of the audience who would be receiving it so that the person would be likely to look at it on their mobile phone and therefore more likely to fall for it. So they added a really tricky element to it, knowing that if people are you know, just getting up and they're getting ready and they just want to check their phone real quick, they might check their email real quick and then might respond to something by accident to Kurt's point about a side task that would catch them off guard and potentially have, cause them to make a mistake. And so that people, um, historically people have been three to five times more likely to fall for a phishing attack from their mobile device. And so that particular organization wanted to focus on that particular aspect and were, wanted to test people on that to try and get them to change that behavior and be more careful in that area. One thing that I had noticed in the report was you talked about some of the demographics uh, in the way you broke down who is most susceptible uh, to phishing. And as millennials come into the workforce, um, is that going to increase, do you think, our, our risk of, of being phished and, and clicking on the link? Or is that going to decrease it? What, what did the state of the phish 2018 have to say about that? So that's an interesting one because I, we found that um, the older populations were 
performing much better with 72% of people 55 and over able to um, identify phishing more quickly than those, that group of people that were 18 to 29. Um, so I do think um, it's an interesting change there, and it is something that is um, somewhat alarming. What I think is that there's a little bit of a pocket, though. So I do think a lot of elementary schools are spending time on this now, and there's a pocket of people who didn't get any kind of training like this in elementary school or, or in their early training that um, are getting it now. So I do think there's like a little window here of this, of this group that's now entering the workforce that didn't get access to it in school, but are going to get it either through their employer or through other ways. The media, of course, and, and mainstream media is talking about fishing all the time now. Um, and I wonder if that isn't part of why um, there's a little bit of a gap there and a difference in those age groups. And I do have hope that that younger generation behind them is getting it and it's just becoming part of their normal suspicion and instinct to not trust emails as much as maybe this one group of people that are represented here. Yeah, and it's likely that you I think what Amy's saying, you'll you'll likely see the fishers evolve. I mean we've seen we've seen social engineers evolve over, you know, how long this has been going on basically forever. Of um, they'll, you know, the email based traps, the you know, or you know, a Facebook message, whatever, those may not work based on the training they've gotten, but you know, they have incentive to continue to figure out what are people using, what are they doing now. And that's the real challenge with this is that it's impersonating what you do, and so um, all you have to do is be off your game slightly, and you've got a decent chance of, fall, of falling for this. And so, um, you know, I, I think we, you're going to see them that they're going to they will continue to change how they target things. And you know, they may not send the same type of fish to a millennial. Um, they might send something more in line with what they're doing, as opposed to a, or an email scam that has a package sending in it or or whatever mm -hmm. things like that. Well, that's a good point too. You're right. It's raising the bar on the cyber criminal to actually make, to adapt to the audience that's coming that's coming of age and whom for whom's money whose money they want, I guess, right? And their access and their credentials, and so they'll have to adapt just like we are. What about a, a key takeaway or two? If you said this is, this is I think, the overarching message that comes from the State of Fish, uh, State of the Fish 2018, is there one? What would it be? Yeah, I mean, I think the key takeaway that, the, that we have is that it's the importance of education and real education, not just simulated attacks um, in, in terms of running a program. Um, and so, the thing is, when you send a simulated attack, it's great because you can really hone in on a specific type of attack and see what your susceptibility is to that. Um, but, the, but like we were talking about in the previous question with, um, you know, people, an attack, basically there being an attack for everyone, is that the only real way, you have to get generalizations going on with it. You have to understand generally how they're trying to attack you and understand that it, it, you're not learning to not click on a mail with a package tracking link on it. You're, you're learning to not click on a link that doesn't go to UPS, for example. Um, and, and, and so only education, you know, outside of the context of some attack can really get you there. You need to be able to generalize that very specific knowledge. Um, I think the other thing going along with it is just program maturity, like Amy talked about earlier, of you can't get lax with this. You know, you don't, the, the thing that's kind of interesting with that is that we're always updating our firewalls, we're updating our virus protection, we're updating everything because we realize the definitions or the, well, the state the system was in a week ago is not going to save us a year from now. Um, but we're not doing that with our programs. I mean, we're running them and we're feeling like, oh, we got, to a, we got down to 5% click rate, that's awesome, we don't have to do anything more. No, you wouldn't leave your firewall definitions back. Um, conversely, you need to continue training and continue educating on what's new, what's different, um, and also just helping build retention because of knowledge loss over time. So uh, I'd say for us, you know, the two big things there is that you really need to do education. You can't just do similar attacks and expect to have a meaningful behavior change. Um, and then you have to continue. This is an ongoing effort. It's never ending. You, you just you want to keep staying ahead of the, the curve on the attacks. Okay, that is fantastic. Is there anything else, any closing thoughts that you wanted to, to leave us with today? Uh, this would be a good time to bring those up. So the last point 
I'd love to make here is that not all educational programs, security awareness and training programs, deliver the same results. And occasionally we do run into people that think, oh, as long as I do something, it's got to be good enough. It doesn't really have to, there's not really any difference between one program and another. And we definitely have seen that the customers that have come to us from using other solutions are coming to us because they're trying to improve their results and they're finding that they were disappointed in the selection that they had made before. So the one thing I would say is don't assume that all training programs are created equally and that the real goal, if your real goal is behavior change, you do need to select your solution carefully and make sure that that is the goal of the solution provider as well, uh, not just a compliance oriented yeah, you're going to do something to check the box and to become compliant, but it's not really going to result in behavior change. If effective results are your goal, then choose carefully. Yeah, I just, all I'd add to that is um, I think you have to under, people have to understand what they're trying to achieve out of their programs, right? I mean, overall, security awareness is part of an overall risk program. You're trying to reduce organizational risk, and in the security awareness program, you're really targeting the end user side of that and how can I uh, you know, use them as an effective part of my security program and also reduce the, the places that they may be strong or, or weak. Um, I think the challenge with that beyond, you know, some organizations at times like we're saying don't do enough. You know, they're simply just sending some to attack. They're not training. They're not leveraging all the tools that they have available to them. The other side is being overly ambitious, too. If you try to, try to improve your users on every topic, you're not going to succeed. There is simply too vast of a threat landscape to, to try to get your users to be experts in everything. Um, so you really have to understand and set reasonable goals for what you're trying to achieve. It might be as simple as saying, I really just want to drop my attachment-based attack rate down this year because we're seeing a lot of attachment-based fish get through our filter and they presented a high risk to the organization. So I want to raise my end user's ability to both report them and not fall for them. Um, and so I did, having a process for identifying tangible goals and driving, driving towards them really is what gives you the best chance of success. Um, doing too much or too little, you kind of get in that Goldilocks zone of just right that, that you need you to really get the best value out of your program. That's a great point. Well, that, that is really insightful, and, and Amy and Kurt, thank you so much uh, for answering all our questions here at Secure World. Uh, I, I've certainly learned a lot about, you know, the backstory and some of the takeaways, too, as well, from the state of the fish, uh, not only this year, 2018, but in previous years as well, and that's been fantastic context. So I'm going to turn it back over now to our host, Tom. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you again, Amy and Kurt, for sharing your experience with us and talking more uh, about the report. Uh, we hope everybody learned a little something from today's interview, uh, perhaps some reminders or things that you can start doing at your company. Uh, be on the lookout for future behind-the-scenes interviews with our media team. On behalf of Secure World, I'd like to thank everyone for their time and participation today. This does conclude our program. <laughs>